want you to know I'm grateful always. When I get to speak in chapel, I'm always a little bit nervous because so many better have spoken from this pulpit, but I'm grateful for any opportunity. I'm also grateful that my younger son, Daniel, can be with us this morning. Um, I can't make any claims about being good at this subject or knowing a lot about this subject because he's here and he knows better. But we're going to talk some about these days of Elijah, especially dealing with burnout. I got to tell you, I must not know much about burnout because every time I picked up a book and looked about it or I even went on Wikipedia and things on the internet, everybody had a different definition of different things that it means. And some of them I looked at and thought, it sounds like you're really just trying to get out of work. And some of them I looked at and I thought, oh, that looks to be an incredible disaster to have happened to you. What I do know is, I don't know if I ever had burnout or not, but when I was in the hospital a few years ago, a doctor told me that I was complicit in the problem I had. He said, you don't sleep, you don't drink a lot of water, you drink anything else, you travel too much, you go too far, you do all these different things, and you finally just depleted your resources, made your body unhealthy, and made it easy for you to get sick. As he walked away, I thought, sort of a mean thing for a doctor to say. But it's probably something I should have addressed much earlier in my ministry. So maybe we can make it where you don't have to lay in that bed that way at any time. We're going to start with a little different part of the days of Elijah. Have you ever had one of those days when everything went right? And you really felt like God was working through you. You sat down to have that meal. Someone came up and talked. The next thing you know, you were in a Bible study or you got up to speak a lesson and you're going through it. And when you get to the end, you're going, well, that was a whole lot better than what I prepared. Or someone comes and says, you said just the right word at just the right time. Sometimes we have days like that. And I hope that we've all had those days. Elijah had a lot of days like that. If you haven't, you will. We're going to talk about a couple of his days. First of all, he, in 1 Kings 17, 1 through 7, God puts a lot of power in his hand. He says the idolatry is horrible. Ahab and Jezebel have turned this nation over to Baal. They have torn God out of it and replaced it with Asherah poles and Baal temples and all these things inside all the great places. And they are more evil than any other king we have had. And when you make the, you're the most evil of all the kings, if you studied 1st, 2nd Kings at all, you know, that's pretty severe. That's pretty bad. Jezebel especially seemed given over to this kind of idol worship. And together, they were killing prophets. They were wiping out altars, doing so many horrible things. And God said, go tell Ahab it's not going to rain until you say so. You come ask me again, I'll send the rain. But I have had enough of this kind of rebellion. And just think about what that did for this young prophet. He stood up and he spoke boldly for God. But God had said, I'm going to work boldly through you. There was the widow of Zarephath. Jezebel was from a region called Sidon. Zarephath was one of the key cities in this region called Sidon. So he goes to escape Jezebel and he goes right, really, underneath her nose in so many different ways. There he meets an older woman, a widow woman, that's out gathering sticks. She's going to prepare one more meal, and then her son and her are going to lay down and die. They just haven't had enough to eat, hadn't had enough to keep them going. Drought is pretty hard. I had someone talk to me the other day, and they said, I don't know how we're going to live through this dryness we're having in Lubbock. Well, we have a lot of access to water. I don't know whether you heard about it or not, but we actually got things to drink. We actually have stores to go to and all those things. But drought in many parts of the world is a death sentence. And it was here. Elijah finds her and he says, can I have a little something to drink? That's asking a lot, isn't it? But he's not done yet. Can you make me a cake of bread? She has to be looking at him saying, well, this is the worst possible timing. But she does. And Elijah said, you make me my bread. You take the flour and the oil and you make your child and you a meal. And God's going to make sure that your jug always has oil as long as this drought goes on and your jar always has flour. It's the miraculous and it's amazing. 
But it wasn't even the biggest miracle that happened in Zarephath. The widow's son dies. We don't know exactly why. Maybe it was related to this drought. It sudden, where it suddenly, we know it wasn't because he didn't have enough flour or oil. There are many other things that go along with drought. He dies. The widow is coming to Elijah going, now you're living in my house. We're doing all these things. We're eating bread together, drinking our water together, and now my son has died. Elijah takes him up to the room he's staying in, lays him out on the bed, lays out over him three different times. And the boy comes back to life, restored to his mother. must have been amazing to see how God was working through Elijah in that moment. He goes and he's going to meet with Ahab and tell him, we're bringing back the rain. But there are some things that are going to have to happen before that. And Obadiah is over the house of Ahab, working there in the king's palace. He is a great and godly man, fears God in great ways. It's probably very hard for him to work there. He had taken a hundred prophets of God, 50 in two pots, put them in caves, and gave them water and bread to eat. He was taking care of them probably from the king's table. Elijah goes to Obadiah and says, go tell Ahab I'm here. And he said, now wait a second, if I go tell him you're here and then we come back over here and you're not here, I'm in real trouble. Also, these prophets will be in real trouble. And Elijah said, I'll be right here when you get back. And then he meets again with Ahab. Only he doesn't tell him the drought's about to end. He's going to do that a little later. Tells him instead, the reign of Baal on my land is about to end. He goes on Mount Carmel. For those of you that have been to the Holy Land, you know, you can look and you can see the top of Mount Carmel for a long ways off because it's in the middle of a big plain. It could be seen for miles to come. And maybe that's the reason Elijah chose it. But he goes up there and there are 450 prophets of Baal that eat at the king's table every day. 400 of Asherah that eat at the king's table every day. So he said, go and get them, get those prophets, bring them down and we will have a little contest. And there he sets up some rules for the game. We're all going to have a bull. You choose the bull that you want. We're all going to put wood on an altar. We're all going to not bring fire. And we're going to call on our God to ignite the sacrifice. Well, the prophets of Baal work on this from morning until evening. About noon, Elijah even starts to help them by getting them great encouragement to try harder. And they begin to cut themselves and scream out and cry even louder. But Baal cannot hear. Baal has no ears. Baal is not a living God. So Elijah goes and says, let's make this more difficult. He digs a trench. He puts together 12 stones, one for all the children of Israel. He lays the wood out on top, lays the bull on top, and then he gets four pitchers of water in three different tiles, making 12 pitchers of water. They pour it over the top until it drains all the way down through the rocks and it fills up the trench. Then he says a very, very simple little prayer. And fire comes from heaven, burns up the bull. That's impressive. Burns up the wood. Burns up the stone. Dries up the water. Everyone there had no problem realizing that a living God had come to be among them. They immediately say, we've made up our mind. We think we're going to go with Jehovah. We think we'll follow him. And Elijah said, let's all go down to the brook together. And he kills the prophets of Baal there he tells Ahab you better start getting ready the drought's going to end he has his servant with him and he says go look off Mount Carbel look out towards the sea and tell me what you see six different times he says I don't see anything and he goes well go look again then he comes back and he said I see a cloud the size of a fist in the sky and he said go tell Ahab he better get on his chariot and get to moving because the floods are coming And then Ahab runs and beats the chariot of the king. It's an amazing thing. Elijah, I'm sorry. Elijah goes and he beats Ahab running. I have a friend who likes to run marathons and all, and he likes to talk about this part of Elijah and how God's going to give him strength to run that far. It's not the far that matters so much. It's the fast. It's an amazing, incredible thing. 
Elijah had some great days. He did great things, didn't he? But sometimes you have a different kind of day. Have you ever had one of those days when you were just out of energy, just frustrated and hurt? Don't talk about test time. That's a little less than what Elijah went through. Have you ever had some of those days? I think we've all had them. Elijah had days like that. If you haven't had days like that, you will. Where you run into a wall, when your energy is depleted, when you just don't think you can go any further. 1 Kings 19, 1 through 14, we read about a prophet who has just given it all and is finding himself laying down by a brook, tired, weary, hurting. Let's read this text together, verse 1 through verse 14 of 1 Kings 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. He was afraid. He arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And there he left his servant. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate, and he drank, and he lay down again. The angel Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat. For the journey is too great for you. And he arose and he ate and drank and went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb. Must have been a really dense bread or something, wasn't it? The Mount of God. Then he came to a cave lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Let's look at a few things that may have caused him to be in this situation. First thing, he's just run for his life after hearing of Jezebel's threats. He feared for his life, and he's been doing a lot of running on just some water and some bread. Next thing is, he leaves his servant, and he decides to face this next part all alone. Another thing is, he felt as though he were all alone in his fight against Ahab, Jezebel, and Baal. You might say, well, he should know better. He talked to Obadiah, remember? But sometimes when you're tired, sometimes when you've given it all out, sometimes when you're hitting that wall, you don't remember everything as clearly. You might even feel alone. Next, he felt let down by his people. He felt frustrated that none were remaining faithful to God, that all were turning away from him. He was tired and he was miserable. And at the worst part of this, he says, I want you just to come and take my life. Can you imagine this great prophet of God who worked, God worked so many great things through getting down to this point? Let's go back and look through that text and let's find some answers. What God does to help him through this time. There are some keys to avoiding overcoming burnout. The first thing is you need to avoid being isolated. You don't need to face your ministry alone. God and his servants are always right there with you. That includes us. If you get out there and you feel like you're hitting the wall and you can't make it any further, start calling people here. We're here for you. We'll help you. 
There will also be people everywhere you go. They may be hidden in caves, but they'll come out of the caves to help you during your time of need. Hopefully you'll have family, you'll have others close to you that can help you during that time. But sometimes whenever you're getting depleted, when you feel really low, when you're getting frustrated, we tend to isolate ourselves and close ourselves off. And that's the worst thing we can do. We've got to take our servant with us. We've got to keep him close. Next thing we need to see is we don't need to expect the incredible or miraculous. It's not the loud things that end up changing things for us. It's not the earthquake. It's not the fire. We need to learn to listen for the still voice. Look for the quiet answers that come from God's word, from faithful people who have studied the word of God, and through praying to God. Sometimes in our time of greatest needs, we start screaming out, we need miracles. Now what you might need is perspective. You might need that quiet voice from God. You might need to open up the book of Psalms and read through it. You may need to go to a trusted friend and say, what would God say to me right now? You may need to turn to God in prayer. You need to learn to rest and relax. There's a time for work, but you need to rest when you can. You need it. Now this is where I become a, a big hypocrite, and I'm sorry for that. Maybe the reason Paul assigned me this task is he wanted me to learn the lesson. I don't know. But isn't it interesting that God, when he created the world, he took that day of Sabbath. You think he was tired? No. I think he knew we would be tired. We would get to the end of our rope. We would get to times where we needed to rebuild. And so from the beginning, he gave us the example. A tireless God gave us an example of a tired people sometimes. We need to learn to rest. I really benefited the other day during the workshop. Ron Bontrager and I talked about this for quite a little while. He's obviously more mature in this way than I am. We've got to learn to get our rest when we can because we need it. You need to remember that it's seldom as bad as you think. Elijah was sort of deceiving himself, wasn't he? He wasn't all alone. They had just killed all the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and all the people said, we're turning back to God. This should have been a better moment, but sometimes we deceive ourselves. We think we're not appreciated when we're appreciated by many. We think we're not cared about when we're cared about by many. It's something we've always got to keep in our mind. That is, in my case, where I go to my wife and say, Brenda, it's a little dark and gloomy. And about five minutes later, I'm feeling pretty good again. Because Brenda is perfect to always remind me of the great silver linings that fill the sky around me all the time. Oops. Can y'all take me back one? We need to remember to avoid hiding. It's different than just being isolated. We've got to go make sure that we are instead searching for folks, not hiding from folks. You need to strengthen yourself through eating and drinking the right things. The doctor told me, well, you love to eat just anything. You've got to stop that. And you've got to remember to drink the one thing that's really going to bring you health. You've got to start putting water back in your diet. And I said, well, that seems a little boring. And he said, there's nothing boring about what it does to your body. You need to start making sure you get eight hours a night. And I couldn't believe eight hours a night. That seemed highly excessive. Turns out it's really very enjoyable. He told me all sorts of things I needed. And what was amazing is they were all simple things that didn't cost me anything just taking care of myself we need to remember to go to the mountain Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai the place where God talks to his people we go to Mount Jerusalem Mount Zion and there on that holy hill we find God and everything he has for us we need to be refreshed with the Word of God I hope that's what's happening this morning here in this chapel as we go through 1 Kings 18 and 19, I hope instead of being drugged down, you end up being refreshed because the Word of God can do that. We need to turn to God. We need to go to our mountain. He was reignited. What happens after this in the life of Elijah? He meets a guy named Elisha. Elijah and Elisha become partners, teammates, and Elisha will someday take his place. Elijah continues to speak out against Ahab and Jezebel for God. 
He hasn't stopped his work. In fact, he's ready now to take it with a renewed vigor, with renewed excitement. Other prophets like Micaiah and others are emboldened to stand up against Ahab. He finds he's not alone. There are others standing up and speaking and saying the things of God around them. Elijah doesn't get to die on this earth. It's funny. It's what he asked God for, wasn't it? God says no. How about I just take you to be with me instead? How about we just skip the dying process and you just come be with me? It was better than anything he could have wished for, anything he could have hoped for, anything he would have known about. It's a great thing. And then Elisha, the one who stood by his side, carries on the work of God in his place. Because prophets aren't supposed to be eternal, they do their job for a while, and then someone else stands, and it's time for Elisha to work. We're all going to have our good days and bad days. You need to get your mind settled on this. Get your friends lined up. Be ready to face the battle with others. Be studying the Word of God. Be praying to God, doing all those things so that you'll be prepared in that day. You need to remember the days of Elijah. The other day we, we sang the song, The Days of Elijah, and I thought it's really sort of deceptive, isn't it? It doesn't tell us much about the days of Elijah at all. It tells us about a lot of days, very generically. We need to think about those real days when a real man who was a prophet of God, faithful, diligent, strong, had great days, but also a day that we can also learn from. You need to do your best. It's not an excuse to never work. It's not an excuse to say, oh, I'm feeling some burnout, I better stop. We still need to do our best for God, and Elijah certainly did. But we also need, in those moments where we can, we need to rest up. We need to spend time with God and our friends. We need to learn to relax a little. We need to study. We need to meditate. And we need to pray. I wish I could talk with you for a while about the spiritual act of meditation. Because it's become very, very important to me. Reading God's word, praying, but then having some time to process as well and journal and write things down has become very important. And I hope it will become important to you. And we need to pray. God's not as distant as we sometimes feel. We need to speak to him. It happens to the best of us. It happened to Elijah. Jesus held Elijah in high esteem. Jesus took him very seriously. The Bible holds him up. When they wanted to paint a picture of who John the Baptist was going to be, they used the picture of Elijah, great hero of the faith. But more than that, a great example that we will go back and look at his days. Thank you.